Um, let me first give a disclaimer. This is a talk. I'm in signal and image processing, and this is a talk me and Martin Vetterly have been giving a few times to signal processing people. It's a similar version now. I assume that here the whole motivational part of it, of convincing people to, to go into reproducible research is a bit redundant, but I'll go through that faster. <coughs> it's actually based on a recent paper that we've written in IEEE Signal Processing Magazine. And actually, if we go a bit back in history, the Royal Society in England celebrates this year it's its 350th anniversary. And actually, already at that time, there were worries that results and experiments should be described so that other researchers can reproduce them, which resulted in both peer-reviewed journals and a bit the scientific culture as we know it today. So in a way, I think related also the invention of printing transformed alchemy into chem chemistry where people could repeat experiments at least if there are um, devices available and, and substances available. Now I think the web should have kind of a tra similar transformational role. And as I said, it's already centuries old. Descartes in, in the 1600s already discussed about a scientific method and already talked about how experiments should be repeatable. And then more recently we had a lot more and a long list of non-reproducible works which have appeared already earlier on so I'll move further. I think if we go more specifically into terms like reproducible research itself in computational sciences, in, as far as I know most of that work was, was started at Stanford by Clarbaut and his group and they, they used make files to build and clean up the results. This was then continued also in the group of Donohoe where, where WaveLab was released using MATLAB which was already discussed earlier today also. And then I think from there and probably from other worries as well, it spread also into various other domains like econometrics, neurophysiology, epidemiology and so on. I think this is typically how we would not want to do research is a, is a cartoon about the uh, recent climate scandal with uh, people working mostly behind closed doors in, instead of share, sharing and being able to reproduce their results. These are some typical quotes that we encountered in our lab. Actually, I, I should say this work mostly relates to the time I spent at, at EPFL in Switzerland doing my PhD and a year of postdoc and then we sometimes got emails I think just like this morning probably these also sound familiar to most of you people send you an email about a paper you've written and there are questions on what exact parameters were used and so on and even if you'd be really willing to to answer them it's of, it often appeared difficult to to get through those I'll skip that um, why would we want to do reproducible research? I think that's not really a question for this audience. But I think it, it, it is a cell of discipline and it's both more efficient and more robust to, to be able to reproduce your own and other people's experiments. It first of all allows a person himself to continue where, where you left your work. It allows others to start from that point and I think that's the whole idea when we're publishing is trying to disclose something to other people so that they can build on it. If we, if we want to prove some new theorem we don't go all the way back and start reproving Pythagoras and so on. So we, we do build on, on each other's results so I think that should be the idea here also. And I'll try to make a point that it increases also the impact of our work although as discussed this morning I don't have any hard uh, results on that either. But I've tried with what I had available. Um, I think we're all related to this publication business or we all 
even if you don't want to, have to follow the publication business and publish or perish. Um, the first indication that, that it does increase the impact is when we look at, at open access, putting PDFs of, of publications available online. We can and, and see this as, as some kind of analogy because if you have to subscribe to a journal to get access to a paper, the access is even more difficult than right now where maybe the, the PDF is available but the, the whole research environment is not available. And people have looked at, at how that evolved over time and actually the, the blue lines here are the oldest years and as it gets greener we get to more recent years and you see that first of all a lot more papers become available. This was, was checked on the archive which is mostly used for, for physics papers I think. And, and also the, the peaks get earlier on so people start citing each other's work er, earlier on because it's easier to get access to it which is kind of natural I think. Now if we if me as, as a signal processing person, I look at other domains, my impression is that in, in mathematics there's uh, at least in not, let's say not computational mathematics but the standard mathematics, there is a habit of, of publishing a whole proof and the proof can be verified. It's typically also verified by the reviewer and based on that you you can see whether you can follow that proof and in that sense reprove it. Now of course there's also a famous counterexample which was Fermat's last theorem where he briefly wrote into the margin that his margin was too small to make the proof but that anyone could uh, make it. Um, it has taken a few hundred years to get to that proof. Now if you look at exact sciences, often people have a much better habit I think of, of describing their experimental setups, which exact substan substances they combined in, in which quantities and so on. In life sciences, at least in some domains there are, there is a habit of repeating other researchers experiments and, and giving some, considering it as standard that people also spend time repeating other people's experiments. And a few, since a few years I think the Journal of Cell Biology now also checks their, the images of papers you submit whether they have been manipulated. Now of course this is some kind of basic check. They check whether it was opened in a, in a tool like Photoshop or so but if you carefully manipulate it I'm sure you could get past their checks. Um, I think in computational sciences we, we should get somehow to a similar level as this. And if I look at signal processing I would situate it a bit between applied mathematics and engineering applications. And I think it would benefit a lot by making things reproducible there because it would of course first of all help the signal processing research advance faster, increase its impact but it's also good practice and I think it also allows research that is done in a certain discipline to be reused in another discipline without other people having to worry about is this well done, is this, aren't there any bugs in the code and so on. So if I look at typ what our typical research consisted of in, in the lab, I would say there are three main components. There's some theoretical work and as long as the, the theorems and the proofs are well described, the theoretical work can be repeated, can be reproven. But of course even there numerical simulations are very helpful. For example if you want to get some understanding of this nice formula about the spectral density of ultra wideband signals, it really helps to, to have some kind of a plot using some, some practical examples. Then a second part is more algorithmic work where typically you would want to as, as already discussed in most of the talks put some code available, make the data available on which you performed the analysis and describe the entire environment that you used. Except of course if you use nice tools like KDE where the whole environment is kind of 
combined in there already. But otherwise, you would want to, to describe, I think, the computer platform, what kind of compiler, software versions, if possible, give a user interface so that other people can more easily access the, the experiments that you did. And then the third part is more on, on data and experimental setups. And there we noticed that it's good to describe the measurement setup and the setup procedures or the calibration procedures. But on the other hand, often such measurements are very hard to repeat. If, for example, you're measuring temperatures and humidity on a glacier, it's impossible to repeat that experiment because the temperatures will be different anyway next to the fact that you would have to go up a glacier again and have to put all those measurement stations around. So then often you'd, you'd rather want to share the data sets and make them reusable instead of having them really reproducible in the, sen in the sense of redoing the measurements. If I look at my own personal experience in my PhD thesis, I can honestly say that for my first and my second conference paper that I wrote, they're not reproducible. I, by that, I don't want to say that um, the results were wrong or, or inconsistent or so, but I just honestly don't know the exact parameters anymore. I have a bunch of versions, and I, I would have to dive into which, which ones produce those precise results. I can get similar results, but not exactly the same as what I had there. Now, when I was writing my first journal paper, when, about one year later, Martin, my, who was at that time my advisor, tried to convince me to make it reproducible. And I think at that point it took me about one week when, when everything was kind of ready to, to put together all the code and the data in a form that I dared to put it online. I, I must admit I, I did, as, as Philip said in the previous talk, just then after putting it together, zip it and put it online. <laughs> so I, I'm, I agree with your, with your graph, but I would say that there's still a lot of space on this left side also. <laughs> you can go much further into the left direction. <laughs> um, so I, I put my paper along with some MATLAB code and data and, and figures online. Then one year later, I was writing a second journal paper. By then I was convinced of making it reproducible. So I did there also, and I think then it took me only, let's say, one additional day, because I already had in mind that I wanted to make it reproducible from the start. So when I was making a figure, I made sure I would be able to, to get back to it later if that's the one that would end up in the paper. So I think, yes, it requires additional work, but depending on how, on, on how experienced you are with it, it, it can get a lot faster if you have like good research practice, which clearly at the start I didn't have yet. Um, in between, a student had also written a user interface for the MATLAB code of the first paper. And then I really got to the advantages of making things reproducible when I was writing up my PhD thesis. Because then I could recycle my own code I didn't have to dive into it again and start figuring out what the hell I intended with these, with these lines of code and with this figure. And I could easily create new figures because, at least for me, some of the papers had different notations and so on, and I wanted to have everything coherent, so I wanted to redo some of the figures, some of the figures on different input data sets. And I think it took me then about three months to write my thesis and it's fair to say that it would have taken me quite a bit more if, if it, I wouldn't have had that code available then. So if I look at, in retrospect, to the benefits for me, first of all, I've been able to efficiently reuse my own results. Secondly, there, I, with this graphical user interface, I always had nice demo material around. And I don't know how it is for you, but there are always visitors and prospective students and so on for which demos and, and posters need to be set up. So that helped a lot. It had, to my big surprise, quite many downloads. Now, I don't know, of course, how to, to grade the quality of my own work, but I don't see it as that exceptional. So I was, I was not expecting so many downloads, and 
like this first paper is still monthly okay these are numbers from 2006 2007 but it gets like around 150 downloads a month I was really surprised by that and I, I checked recently and it still gets like around 150 or two down, 200 downloads a month and even if only let's say 10 or 1 percent of that is not coming from robots and so on it's still a few people a month that want to use my code and I'm still glad about that certainly if as one of the previous speakers was also saying a standard paper is maybe read by one or two people well then at least my code is downloaded quite a lot more than that so, so the first paper which you struggle to make reproducible is downloaded a lot the second paper which was smooth to make reproducible is not <laughs> Uh, what shall I say? <laughs> no, I think it. So is that the topic, or is that? It's, it's mostly the topic, and I think the fact that there was a user interface for the for the first one now. And I don't have a user interface for the second one, so they really have to dive into the MATLAB commands. And it's also about a, a method that is less applicable to standard images, so both the topic and then the fact of having a user interface made that the first one is, is downloaded so much more than the second one. But still, if the second one, which I consider in, in practice just for standard images is, is often hard to apply because of rem memory requirements and so on, if it's still downloaded, I don't know, five times a month, then, okay, four are robots, but then one is still left, so. <laughs> Actually, the robots don't care if there's nice to the interface. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that would mean that only like five at most of the 200 can be robots. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, I also got some nice reactions, which I think is always nice to, to get if you have code available online. People that, that really appreciate that you made it available and want to reuse it for, for some of their experiments. Of course, also there, in many cases, it's used, it's used to compare their method against and they will only include it in their paper if they do better, of course, but that's life. At least it's, it's used then. Yeah, so that's helpful. We got some nice collaborations out of that. Um, okay, so that rounds off that part. Then we tried to, to do a study on reproducibility of, of standard image processing papers. Um, if I look at, we, look, we took one year of the papers of, of, let's say, our most or highest rank image processing journal in, in our field. So that means there were about 134, or not about, exactly 134 papers published in the year 2004. We performed this study in 2007, I think. So we, we went back a few years because we wanted to be able to, to check that uh, papers that were published a few years earlier. And we, we sent those papers out to, to reviewers. About 90 people helped, helped us out in that. And we asked them questions to answer quest to read the paper and answer questions about the reproducibility of the algorithms, the code, and the data. So let me specify here, we did not ask them to reproduce the results. We asked them whether they think they would be able to reproduce the results. For example, on the algorithm, we asked whether the algorithm, oops, whether the algorithm was described in sufficient detail, whether precise parameter values are given because some people tend to omit those. Uh, whether there was a block diagram or some pseudocode, which are often helpful in my experience in understanding what an algorithm does. Whether there are proofs for all the theorems and whether the algorithm is compared to some other algorithms. And then, okay. And then concerning the code, we asked whether enough implementation details were given to be able to implement it. 
and whether the code was available online. And about the data, we asked whether there was an explanation of what the data represents. We asked whether the size of the data set was acceptable. Or actually, I think we, we asked what the size of the data set was, and then we turned something like more than four images into acceptable. Um, and whether the data set is available online. And here are the results. I think in general, people consider that the algorithm and the data are pretty well described. Two thirds of the papers compare their algorithm to some other, to other algorithms, which I think is also quite nice or still. About half of the articles contain either a block diagram or some pseudocode. Now, of course, with these results, you also have to consider the fact that some papers of the, out of those 134 just present some theoretical results. So then it's irrelevant whether there's a block diagram or, a, or pseudocode if it's just theoretical. And, and similarly, yeah, other, peop, other papers don't have a proof, but if, if there's nothing to be proven in a the paper, then that's also fair, I think. Uh, about one third of the papers have data available online. And personally, I consider that still as quite optimistic. Um, I think probably many of them used, used a LENA image, which is in image processing a standard image, often used for many purposes, many more than what it was maybe originally useful for, even though one can wonder whether it was useful for the original compression purposes. Plus, there are also multiple versions of such an image available online. And typically, it's not clear which one was used. And only about 9% had code available online, which is consistent with what Victoria showed yesterday for a few years ago also, I think. So if you look at those numbers, or no, if you talk with people about this, everyone agrees that this is how, how research should be done and so on. And, and you rarely find someone that says, no, you should not have, have your code at least reproducible by yourself. But still, it's not, not happening or, or not happening that much so far, I think. What kind of motivations can there be for that? I think, first of all, it's extra work. Even if I, redu I went back from one week to one day, it's still one day that I didn't spend doing other things. Often people, at least in our community, seem to have the impression that publishers don't like it. I think often publishers either don't care or allow it or even think that it would be nice because it, it gives some more value to the papers published in their journals. People also often say you don't get enough credit for it. Well, whether you get enough or not is, is hard to say, but I think with the additional citations and so on, you, you do get some credit for it. People argue that it gives other people an advantage because they can immediately start from what you've done. I think that's in a way what, what you intended to do when you, when you publish a paper. So then I think it's probably more fair not to publish the paper at all. And of course, you need to disclose everything. <coughs> People often are often not very proud of the tuning they did in the end to get that one nice result in that one figure. Well, that's somehow eliminated here. Whether that's bad or good, I leave it open. And I think it will also increase the quality of, of our papers. So in a way, the, the smallest increment that you can still publish as a new paper will probably increase. But I think, I don't know, I think that if, if now I, I tweak my parameters and I try to republish that, it, if, the, if the code is available online and people see that I just retweaked my parameters and with the same code went, went for a second paper, it's probably more difficult to get it accepted than if you slightly change your description of the paper with some different parameters and publish it again. But that's, of course, purely an estimate. Considering software platforms, I won't go too far into this because there have been some nice tools described here earlier, and I'm not an expert on that. I think there are a lot of different tools available, different programming languages, commercial software packages, open source software packages. Should you use only open source or 
or can you also use commercial packages? I don't know. I think essentially, I think ideally you want to make your results as easily reproducible as possible. In a way, the easiest thing is, is if you have to do a simple click or a simple command to reproduce someone else's results. On the other hand, as it was also mentioned, I think, yesterday, um, maybe that's too easy so that people just copy the whole thing and, and don't, don't see the bugs that they copy along also. But, yeah, it's a matter of making a trade-off, I think. There are a wide variety of tools. Um, I should add a lot more here, like CDE and all the different ones announced on this workshop so, or described on this workshop. They are around for longer, but I am not, just not aware of everything. And then I think the question is also, what can you consider as standard tools? For example, in, in signal and image processing, MATLAB is used a lot, but it's an expensive tool for many. So do you consider this as available to everyone and use it, or should it be in open source software so that people anywhere can, can also reuse it? I don't know. I think it's a trade-off in the, in the amount of work. I think making things easily reproducible, we have to admit, is time-consuming for the author. We can try to optimize this with the right tools, but it's always time-consuming for the author. But it probably save ta saves time for the reader. So if we can get to the figure on the right instead of the part on the left, and by that increase the number of readers, I think as an author you're also happy with the results. Um, this is the famous Lena image, by the way. Um, there is a question. <laughs> Sorry, Victoria. Is it from Playboy? So I want to read it. And NSF doesn't like people use it, by the way. Oh, they don't. I've heard program managers say they refuse to fund work if they use the Lena image. Well, let me put it this way. I, I don't use it here. I only want to illustrate with this the... <laughs> The difference between you can use your own data set, you can make use of standardized data sets. I don't think this is a data set because it's one image, but uh, typically if you use your own data, you have to carefully check, of course, the rights of making that data available. Certainly if you're working on medical data and sensitive data, so anonymization and, and or giving only a sample away are different approaches to do that and I think or should, yeah. Working with sensitive data should not be an easy excuse for not making anything available online. And I think it's very important to describe the data that you've used. What do they represent? How did you acquire those data? There are a lot of, the image is gone, Victor. <laughs> A lot of data set competitions. Um, there is, for example, as, as was already discussed earlier today, this Netflix competition. But of course, then you get into privacy issues also if people manage to ident identify some of the users in the Netflix database. I think it's, it is a nice way of being able to compare a lot of different algorithms on a single data set and then, and then discussing that either on a conference or, or using such big competitions where big rewards are available. I will, I'll skip this because Victoria will talk more about this later, I think. Um, maybe one short comment. My impression is that if people also often don't want to make their code or data available if they say, well, I want to do, maybe I want to do a startup with this. And then if I first make it all available, it's going to ruin my chances with a startup. Depending on the area, that might be true, might be not true. Um, I think in such a case, it would be nice to have some kind of a special setup where you can submit your, your data to a website and you get the processed results back or so, in a sense that at least you can look at results on your own data set or, or challenge an algorithm a bit more even though you don't get 100% disclosure and, and access to the entire code. And to a future startup, it has an additional advantage because your code gets tested on more data 
and you can even if you manage the the rights to the data well I think you can even get access to a, a large test database uh, our next question when when working on this was how to make those data available and as probably on many universities our university was trying to set up some central repository where they wanted to, us to upload all the publications we made. However, it was very difficult in that one to, to put uh, some additional material available and still have it visible in, let's say, in some kind of a nice way. Typically, I think, I think at that point we could upload additional material, but it would just be like one line if you click further for some details and after a few clicks we, you would get to, to the actual zip file. So what we did at that point is we created our own repository setup, which I think was fairly easy to set up, although repositories tend to be not so easy to set up and tend to be intended for large scale development. And we created then a website with, with the reference, the full text, the code, the data. And I think it's, it is probably a, a safer way to, to put these things in kind of centralized repositories rather than on, on personal web pages in the sense that often with personal web pages you run into the problem that after a PhD student has finished his PhD the web page is no longer available and then you can start browsing around whether it might be available somewhere else at that point. Now with this repository we also had a question on okay we make this all reproducible and make it available online to others it would be nice to be able to share that it is actually reproducible because just me putting my lousy code for a lousy paper online still doesn't make it necessarily reproducible. If, if my code is, is wrong or, or has bugs then, then it will not be reproducible. So we added something there because I think asking the publisher or the reviewers to, to check this for a publisher is expensive and for reviewers I personally experienced that finding reviewers is already a very hard task so asking them something more will probably even further reduce the number of reviewers so I'm not sure that that's the way we should go so I think it we there we try to to make it possible for readers to evaluate and 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 leave some some comments on how well things worked we made it very simple that they could check a box whether they were able or not able to, to reproduce the results. And then people would also be able to learn from pre previous comments because if you put your code available online, you do get questions about, about the code. And it's nice to have to answer every question not 10 times. Um, on the practical side, I must admit that on this, this repository here, we barely get comments or people clicking whether it was reproducible or not. So I still end up answering a lot of emails with questions. Also about how to start, how to start <coughs> a function in MATLAB and so on, which is sometimes annoying to answer. <coughs> Um, I think now I'll give a brief, my brief indications about how reproducible research does increase the impact of, of papers. Um, it is shown in a number of studies, I cite one here, but there are multiple of them now that papers that are available in open access online are cited about three times more often than, than other papers. The three, the, number, the exact number varies a bit depending on the study, but they are cited more often. I think an analogy can be made for reproducible research. Papers with online data sets have about 70% more citations. I think this already gets closer to having data and code online. Of course, this was in a specific domain. You can check the paper itself for more details. I think it's likely that something similar with a higher or lower number holds true for reproducible results. 
I think it definitely gives increased visibility to your papers, although that's of course something mixed in the sense that if all papers are reproducible, the increased visibility will, will go down again because it's normal that every result is reproducible. For example, as I said, there are more than 200 downloads per month of my super resolution code. Another example, we wrote a red eye removal paper at some point with online Java code. And that paper, so the, the actual paper, was for, for six months the most popular download in our university database, which I think is also quite an achievement already. And then we tried with the results from our reproducibility study to, to see whether we could see a relation between the highly cited papers and the papers that had code available online. I didn't get further than this, which made, made me conclude that we didn't have enough data points to really get to, to the results. But to the left, I have indicated the papers that have code available online and to the right, the ones that have data available online. And so the score as it goes up higher vertically. So on top we have, we have things that are available online. Here they're not available online. And we have some results in between because we had multiple people reviewing a paper. And sometimes some said that there was data available online, others did not. I did not go personally into checking all the, all the reviews. I think that's probably about the data, often also related whether you consider if, if people you refer to some data set, you go and look for it, or whether you consider that it's only available if they point to, the, to a specific data set. But you can see that the papers that do have high, high citations, so that's the papers to the, to the right in the graphs, they do tend to, to be on top as well. Okay, it does not hold true if you go more to the left side. But then, as I said before, probably making your code and data available online for an average paper or a low quality paper still doesn't make it a good paper either. So I, I wouldn't expect that, that everything would be nicely on a line here. You can have papers up here and it doesn't make them highly cited by default. Um, maybe some thoughts on the publication business, although I must admit those slides are more from Martin Vetterly than mine. Um, there are journals with very high impact factors, while in, in electrical engineering and image processing, we typically, as, as it was mentioned before, get to maybe one or two or so. So how, how to get up? I don't know. I think some, some action on the, on the publication business would be expected there. There's a strongly increasing number of papers with less and less impact on the research and the real world because how do you still find your way through that forest of papers that is monthly published and if you subscribe sent to your desktop. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, we've only got a few minutes before the yeah. coffee break. I'm <laughs> almost done also. Um, so why don't we have in, in signal processing but I get the impression this holds true for, for some other fields also. High impact journals, we can either get to some easy excuses or start thinking about how, how to improve the impact of something we publish. Because I'd rather publish less and get more citations or get, get more impact with it. On the other hand, the current publication business is just on, on getting as much, as, as much published as possible so how to get out of this, how to, maybe we should somehow also create some kind of grand challenges for, for our communities to, to kind of motivate each other to, to work on a specific data set and get things through. Um, so to conclude, I, I think I have given some indications that making your research reproducible increases the impact in terms of number of citations, but also in terms of access to your publications. And I think I'd like to end with this quote that we should try to stand on each other's shoulders and not on each other's toes. 
And yeah, I think some more information is available there, although probably most of you won't find a lot of new information there. <laughs> okay, that's concluded. Thank you. I actually had one more slide. Sometimes reproducibility can go, can go too far. If you look at this paper and this one, <laughs> they were both published in the IEEE somewhere. Um, the one on the right is reproduced a little too far. I, I did take out the authors, but if you look at the two papers, except for bad copying, not much is different. <laughs> Uh, we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. I think it's third. Yeah. This one, can you go back to the previous slide about the, the grand challenge thing? One more? Yeah, I think some people talk about this, right? There's like this like dark path, this executable paper grand challenge. I think. Oh, yeah. severe? Yeah. 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 Well, that's right. Not yeah. Not dark, yeah. Dark with the cars. I think there's a talk about this tomorrow, right? Yeah, I think Dan Furt might be saying something about it. So yeah, just spoil it. Okay. People are working in that. Yeah. That whole point. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you for stepping in at the last moment. You're welcome. Congratulations. Very nice to get you in the spot. And we have a coffee break now for half an hour. Thank you. Okay.